and we're honored to have a distinguished physicist from a distinguished department, <laughs> <laughs> our own Mark Hershow, um, who's going to talk about bugs. Uh, <laughs> anyway, um, so Mark, I think, started his life and uh, grew up in the uh, University of Florida. He then joined the marching band at Stanford, where he also got his degree. Um, after Stanford, he went to Harvard, where he was pulling DNA through nanopores and materials, and that drove him buggy. Um, <laughs> so he then did a, a, a postdoc uh, at Harvard, and then came here. And he's a member of the physics department, and neuroscience, and the Neuroscience Institute. He's already won many awards. The Kavli, he's a Kavli Science Fellow, Simon Fellow. He got the New Innovators Award, the Career Award. And he's going to tell us today about bugs. And how do you think? How do you think about bugs? Okay, so, um, so I'm going to start by uh, giving out credit and blame. Um, I'm going to tell you a little bit about why I work in the maggot, and um, then uh, just one little brief snippet about a decision that it makes um, that we are trying to investigate the neural basis for. Um, I'll tell you about the new microscope we built so that we can see how the, uh, the nervous system of this organism encodes this decision. And then I'm going to tell you about some more mathy stuff that we've done that might get closer to making you feel like you've watched a physics talk. Um, <laughs> That's focused. Am I? It's too late to make about it. Okay, it's, un it's unfocusable anyway, probably. All right. So uh, the credit should go to these people. Um, uh, um, everyone bolded uh, is an author on one of the uh, papers that I'm going to discuss today. Um, and if you want to update my tenure package, Sophie Dvali was best in uh, undergraduate research uh, presentation this year. Oral, uh, just recently. That doesn't make it, so uh, congratulations. Okay, um, and now the gracious thing would be for me to say that all the good things are due to these people, and all the bad things, the mistakes are my own. But what I'm going to do instead is blame these people um, <laughs> for any mistakes, because this one week old picture was only taken uh, six weeks ago, um, and so the combination of them has not allowed me to sleep very much. Um, so if I say something crazy, it's probably just biology, but it could be a lack of sleep. Um, <laughs> okay. Um, oh, and, and Dylan wants to give a shout out to the nice lady with the black ukulele and the, uh, yeah, that's you, and the <laughs> balloon man. Where's the sound? <laughs> uh, okay. Um, so I'll just briefly tell you that uh, there's a lot of intersection between uh, physics and neuroscience. Um, on the technology end, uh, physics has contributed uh, tremendously uh, to ways we can investigate neural activity. Um, there's a lot of different mathematics and modeling that we have contributed. Um, they have contributed problems to us, or we have contributed problems to us. Um, there's been a, I, I had written down on this slide string theory refugees instead of theorists, but I decided that wouldn't help me, but I said it anyway. So, um, uh, but certainly like a lot, of, a lot of interesting things you can do. Um, and when people say, why is this physics? I say, well, brains are squishy and we have lasers. Um, <laughs> So hopefully you guys set that up later. Um, now, the human brain is not great for experiments. Um, there are a lot of neurons. It's inside a skull. If you drill into an undergraduate's head, their parents complain. Um, so we, uh, we look for a simpler model. And so what do you want? In a, you, you, know, you, do, want to have it, you want it to have neurons, uh, because brains are made out of neurons. Um, but you don't want it to have too many. Um, you would like to know how those neurons connect to each other. So you'd like to have some kind of circuit diagram. An analogy to if you were looking at um, a piece of electronics and trying to figure out how that works, you'd want to have a wire and diagram for that. Um, this is kind of important. You want labeled parts. Um, you know, when you look at uh, a, a circuit um, and you're trying to figure out what it does, it's nice if you can relate the part that you're looking at to the part in your wiring diagram, either because it's written on or always in the same place or whatever. And it turns out that's not a general characteristic of brains, that you can go look at a particular neuron and figure out uh, what it is from organism to organism, the unique cellular identity. Um, and then uh, physics analogy, you want an oscilloscope that you can use to probe what's going on. 
uh, in the circuit, and you want a soldering iron that you can use to make changes to that circuit. Um, so uh, here's the Wikipedia picture of a neuron. Um, all you really need to know is that a neuron uh, is an electrically active cell, um, and neurons communicate with each other through synapses uh, and gap junctions. And so um, a gap junction is just basically a spot where there's some resistor, so current can flow. Um, and a chemical synapse uses the transduction of electrical activity to a release of chemicals, which then gets re, uh, a re uh, the, the, the receiving neuron then takes those chemicals and turns them into an electrical signal. And that does two things for you. One, it allows directionality, um, so that you have uh, an upstream or a downstream, right? If you've ever built a circuit with only active, with only passive components, you know the only way to give directionality is to um, control your impedances, and, and so you end up with very large impedances very quickly, and a transistor solves that problem for you. So synapses allow you to have directionality, and they also allow sign inversions, so something can inhibit something else. Um, okay, when you um, wire a bunch of neurons together, you get a circuit. Um, we kind of have this um, abstract idea of a neural network, you know, um, where you have circles connected with lines and arrows. Um, at top is what you might see looking at an artificial neural network. Even at that level of circles and lines and arrows, an actual biological neural circuit is, uh, is more complicated. Um, and um, so this is actually just um, a few neurons in the larva responsible for memory uh, formation and how they, those 24 neurons are wired to each other. Um, and, and you can see there's just a tremendous amount of detail there. Uh, so it gets complicated quickly. And then uh, with neuron number. And then the other thing is a real difference between brains and computers is if you go to a computer and you t it doesn't matter how big it is, if you break one of the transistors, the thing stops working. Um, um, whereas, you know, as, as we all experience every day after the colloquium, um, you can kill a few brain neurons and no one notices, right? <laughs> um, and so that's actually a real bug, not a feature. You're trying to figure out how things work because that means no one neuron is responsible for anything, right? And so you can't just look at one thing and know what's happening. You also can't take one thing out and know what's happening. So the more fault tolerant it is, actually the less useful it is, is for study uh, at the individual neuron level um, for us. Okay. Um, so here are, on a log scale, some model organisms, how many neurons they have. So um, on the left is the famous roundworm uh, C. elegans. Uh, Below that is the sea squirt uh, larva. So it's Siona intestinalis. So if you work on that, you get to say intestinalis a lot. Um, <laughs> then uh, with, between, uh, with around 10,000 neurons, we have the larva. Um, the larval zebrafish up there has 100,000 um, and then grows to millions as an adult. Uh, the, the adult fly has a similar number. Um, then you get into the hundreds of millions with, uh, with mice and, and birds. Um, and then finally hundreds of billions uh, for, for primates. Um, and so the farther on the left you can be, um, the easier things are for you, right? And uh, in particular, if you can avoid having a spinal cord, that also makes things a lot easier uh, on the research end. Um, so we, we like the larva. Um, it's one of three organisms for which we actually have a complete wiring diagram. Um, so the first uh, is the famous C. elegans, which was done in 1986. Um, and then the sea squirt uh, was just published a few years ago. Um, the larva hasn't actually been fully published yet, but it's fully done. Um, so it's, it's been reconstructed, um, and we just ha have to wait as people publish the, the parts they have reconstructed to get it. Um, uh, but so, so in all these organisms, if you look at any one neuron, I can tell you where it receives input and where the output goes. And that's a tremendous value in understanding the circuit, even if you don't use it for any other modeling purposes. Um, and then what this figure also shows is, so, so this is kind of a very arty uh, reproduction um, that Albert did. Um, so these spheres represent location of cell bodies, and then the, uh, the lines are kind of the processes, how they all work together. It's a big jumbled mess. Um, when you look at anything that's complicated, of course. Um, but you can pull that big jumble mass and say, I, I want one neuron, and there it is. Okay, that's one neuron invented nerve cord. And then the thing you can do in the larva is you can say, I want to label just that neuron. And you can find a genetic driver line that allows you to look at just So this is a different larva, right? This, this, this larva um, was reconstructed, you know, chopped up. Then they went to a different larva and labeled one of the neurons to glow red, and it's the same neuron. So you can find the same neuron 
from animal to animal, and we have the genetic tools to identify it, right? So that's huge. Because as you go through the wiring diagram, if you say, this neuron is interesting to me, you can find its downstream partners, you can find its upstream partners, and you can identify them, and then you can manipulate them genetically. So um, a word on this GAL4 UAS, um, because I doubt it's familiar to people outside my lab. Um, well, in this, it's very familiar to people in the world at large, um, but in this room, perhaps not outside my lab. Um, so um, every cell in your body has the same genes. They don't express the same genes because you have a whole network of regulation transcription factors that control which genes are expressed. That's what lets an eye cell be different from a heart cell from a brain cell. Um, now, even single cell organisms like yeast have to control gene expression. Right, because they might be in an aerobic environment need to produce one set of proteins. In an anaerobic environment, they would need to produce another well. one. Okay. So GAL4 is a yeast transcription activator. It looks for a specific sequence in the yeast genome called the UAS. It gloms onto that, okay, and then it recruits this mechanism in the cell to transcribe what's downstream into messenger RNA, which then becomes expressed as proteins. And it's very good. It makes a lot of protein. Okay. So you can take the gene for GAL4, and you can put it downstream of a native fly promoter, and you can get GAL4 expression in particular cells, for instance, the eye. Okay? Um, and it will just sit there. You can, this cell now has GAL4, and as far as anyone can tell, GAL4 doesn't really do anything. That's not harmful, it's not helpful, and there's nothing in the fly's genome for the GAL4 to bind on for. It's missing that UAS, so it just sits there. Okay? You can take a second fly where you put some other gene, like say GFP, downstream of UAS, and then using techniques that are now standard in, in, in biology, um, just insert that into the genome. Okay, so now you have a fly with this UAS GFP. And that fly won't do anything with the GFP because nothing in the fly's regulatory system knows what to do with the UAS. So nothing binds to it, nothing happens. But now, oops, did it? Uh, oh, oh, PowerPoint, sorry, or keynote. Okay, now if you take the GAL4 fly and the UAS fly, they're, and you put them together in a bottle, their progeny has GAL4 in the eye, and in, that, in those eyes only, the GAL4 will bind to the UAS site and express GFP. So you have GFP in, in, in the eyes, and you have a glowing green eye. Okay? You could instead do GAL4, uh, you, um, the, same, the same eye GAL4, and cross it with HID Reaper, US HID Reaper, which kills cells, and now the fly will be blind. Right? Have no eyes. So it's a very powerful tool, and it's so simple. Even physicists can do it, right? And so this is the, the real difference, right? So let me tell you how you do it. So you go to the web, you find the GAL4 line you want, uh, and you find the UAS line you want. You may have to write a lab and say, would you please send me the fly? And then they will. But oftentimes it's in the stock center, in which case you can get between $4 and $8, depending on how many you previously were. They mail it to you. Okay? And then you have to tell the boys from the girls, all right? So can people tell that these are a different color? OK, good. And can you see that this? Is the male sex organ and this is the female? You can tell the difference there? Okay, good. Now I've taught you everything you need to know, except one other thing, which is I have to teach you because flies are awesome, and once they have mated, will store sperm for weeks to reuse. Um, you need to get the flies before they've mated if you want to control the crossing. So you have to be able to tell that there's this dark spot here when they just first come out of the uh, pupa, and that means they haven't mated because they're not old enough. So you have to be able to tell the virgin females and the males, and you sort them through, and then you put them in a bottle together, and you will get the right thing. Um, and so this is something we do every day in my lab. It takes about an hour to teach someone this, and this takes them a couple of days before they um, get the right ones all the time, but, but then it's done. Um, and uh, so we can do very, very complex genetic manipulations without having any of the tools of microbiology you might think you would need. Um, so it's a great resource for us. All right. Um, okay, so here's a neuron uh, from the physics view. It's a bag. It is charged, and the reason it's charged is because it separates ions, right? And so, uh, in particular, there's a low level of sodium in the cell um, that causes it to be negatively charged relative to its environment. Okay, when the cell is active, voltage-gated um, sodium channels open and allow sodium into the cell and allow calcium into the cell as well. Um, and this actually brings the charge of the neuron up above zero, so it's positively charged um, relative <laughs> to its environment. Okay? And then um, these potassium channels open, pump the potassium, let the potassium out, and it actually goes a little bit negative, um, and then it recovers. And this can be very fast. Neurons can spike uh, at kilohertz rates in some cases. Okay. Um, 
And so what you would ideally want is you would want to be able just to measure that voltage directly. That's the best measure. Um, but it's challenging in a moving, behaving animal to um, actually insert an electrode into a neuron without you know, ripping it apart. And to do for, for many thousands of neurons, it would be very hard. Um, there are other measure, measure, me, uh, methods of measuring electrical activity extracellularly where you can see the spiking. Um, but a new tool that's very good are these um, optical indicators of neural activity. And in particular, one that's very useful to us is called GCAMP. So it's a jellyfish protein, the green fluorescent protein, that has been specially engineered so that it only fluoresces brightly in the presence of calcium. Okay. So when the neuron is inactive, this, this, uh, this protein is dark. And when it's active, the protein becomes bright. And so then using standard fluorescence microscopy, we can read out the activity of a neuron. And we can do this for many neurons in parallel. And because it's a protein that we can control the expression of, we can put it into neurons that we know about. Um, using uh, the fly genetics I was telling you about. Okay? And the larva is clear. So that means we can actually just look through the skin of a larva and see what it is thinking. That is the promise of this animal. Okay. Um, so I, I mentioned um, you can think of the GAL4 as, a as, a, as an address book, and UAS as packages. And they have all sorts of lovely packages you can send to cells that will kill them, make them silent, make them hyperactive, make them temperature sensitive. Um, uh, shut off specific gene expression. Um, but one that is in, in particularly useful for us is, um, is our optogenetic reagents. Um, so this is the, uh, a little um, drawing cartoon of the algal photoreceptor channel rhodopsin. Um, and when you shine light on channel rhodopsin, it opens and allows positive ions into the cell, um, which causes the vulture spike. So if you take the gene for channel rhodopsin, put it into a neuron, now you can activate the neuron using light. Um, and again, oh, well, I wanted to have a little cartoon that the larva is supposed to prop up clear, but again, I haven't seen. But again, larva is clear, so you can do this even uh, in animals that are just crawling around. You can label individual neurons, and then every time you turn on the light, that neuron fires. Yeah. All right. So um, this is an animal that has a compact, spatially and numerically simple uh, nervous system. There's about 10,000 altogether, but only a few thousand in the brain, and the rest in the ventral nerve cord. Um, Individual neurons are identifiable and genetically targetable, and that's true even if you're a physicist. Right? It is easy to do this uh, for us. Um, we know how the neurons connect to each other, um, and we can measure and manipulate activity using light in the neurons that we specified throughout the entire brain. It's all optically accessible and through the cuticle of clear animals. Okay? So this is a larva crawling on agar. Um, this larva might be older than some of the people in this room because this video is very old. Um, but what you can do is you can make a video under infrared light of an animal crawling. You can analyze it using uh, software, uh, machine vision software. And you can fly out these very clear behaviors of runs and turns. Okay. And this is the decision I want to tell you about is um, whether to run or uh, turn. Okay. So what you'll notice if you put a bunch of larva on a plate uh, in an odor gradient or temperature gradient or something like this, you'll see that runs in the correct direction, in the favorable direction, uh, are longer than runs away uh, from the favorable direction. So if this is an odor source, if you're headed towards the banana, the runs are longer than if you're headed away from the banana. And so even if that's the only thing you did, if you add up every run towards every run away, um, the ones runs towards even the same number as the runs away are longer on average, and so you make progress. Okay, so that's the bi one of the biases that allows them to navigate. Um, bacteria do this, roundworms do this. This is a very common strategy. Okay, and the question then is, how does it know it's headed towards the banana? Right. Well, when it's headed away from the banana, what it'll notice is that the odor concentration is decreasing in time. Right. It will smell less with its nose as it crawls away. Whereas if it's headed towards it, it will notice the odor is increasing in time. Okay. And so what I'm going to tell you is that the larva is doing a temporal decision. It's taking the odor in its nose, and if that's increasing, it says keep running, and if it's decreasing, it says turn. And if that's true, I should be able to trick the larva. Okay, so what I can do is I can put them in a flow chamber where for five minutes, everywhere you go, concentration is increasing. And for five minutes, it's decreasing. Okay? And what I would expect then is that when the odor concentration is increasing, the larvae think they're headed the right way, and they suppress turning. And when the odor concentration is decreasing, they think they're headed the wrong way, and they uh, turn more often. Right? And this is a purely temporal comparison. There's no spatial information here. Right? If you take carbon dioxide, which they don't like, 
Now you see the reverse. As you increase the carbon dioxide concentration, larvae turn more often, and as you decrease the concentration, uh, they turn less often. Okay? They also don't like light, um, and so as I decrease the light, you see less turning, and increase the light, you see more turning. And what I want to emphasize in all these cases, it's the change in the stimulus and not its absolute value that determines what they do. Right? So all, at least uh, points I've marked is the same value, same concentration of um, odor or the same light level, but the turn rate is different depending on the derivative. <coughs> all right. So the, in, in kind of layman's language, the larva says, if life is getting worse, I want to turn. If life is getting better, I should keep crawling. Right? That's a computation. Right? The inputs are from the sensory system, the nose, the eyes, etc. The outputs are through movement, which is controlled by motor neurons. Okay? So now, one of the things we can ask is, what is the mathematical form of this computation? Right? We can ask, what are the relevant temporal features in the sensory input? We can ask, what is the gain that relates the size of the change in input to the effect on the behavioral output? Right? Presumably, you want to do something a little bit different. It's a big change and a small change. Um, we can ask what happens when more than one sensory system provides input. What if the nose is getting better but the eye is getting worse? How do you handle that? Um, and then we can ask, how does the computation depend on recent history? Is this purely Markovian? Is there some adaptation? So, okay. And then we can ask, what neurons carry out this computation and how? Okay. And so what I'm going to tell you about first is a tool we've developed that hopefully will allow us to answer this second question. Uh, because it's been an outstanding one in our field. Okay. So this is an example of how something truly miraculous has become routine. Right? So this is that uh, a variant of that jellyfish protein that's been engineered into a fluorescent calcium sensor. Okay? Using yeast transcription factors that have been inserted using genetic engineering into flies, I've expressed that protein just in motor neurons. Okay? Then, we visualize the fluorescence using two-photon excitation point scan microscopy, which means we're dragging 140 femtosecond pulses of micron light, uh, focused in submicron volumes, and they're so bright and so intense that even though they have a longer wavelength uh, than the uh, band gap, or the, the, the energy splitting between the uh, ground and excited state, they're still able to excite the indicator to excited state. Then the indicator decays, the protein decays, fluorescently emits photons, which you collect individual photons and count them using PMTs and get the arrival time using an FPGA to within about 25 nanoseconds. Okay. And this is totally boring. Right? This would not make an undergraduate research poster. It's so routine now, which is amazing right, when you think about it. Right? And so what you're seeing here is a squished larva. We've put it under a cover slip. And uh, the tail is to the left, the head is to the right. And the ways of activity that you're seeing is the larva trying to get unsquished. It's trying to crawl forward and it can't. Um, and we sped it up a whole lot so that it looks cool, right? Mm -hmm. uh, but because it's squished, it's actually moving very slowly. So what we'd like to do is do the same kind of measurement in a moving animal. And again, the larva is clear, so this should be straightforward. But it turns out not to be straightforward. No one has been able to do it before my lab. And here's the reason. So this is a work for Ellie Hexer's lab in Chicago. And this is just a wide field microscope image of the larva um, over here is its head, its tail is back here, this is its brain, okay? and then each of these is one segment that's innervated by a motor neuron that controls contraction. All right? And so this is just labeled a GFP. Um, and so watch what the brain does as the larva crawls. It moves up and back, and then it shoots forward. Right? You can see that the cuticle compresses over the brain. Um, and, uh, you know, if you do any kind of imaging, you know that this is a mess, right? Because, you, because a microscope wants to focus on one particular plane. When you move transverse to the plane, um, it causes uh, tremendous artifacts. There's kind of a rapid motion in the plane. Um, unlike, say, C. elegans, the motion of the brain isn't correlated with motion of the body. You can't just look at the body and know where the brain is. Um, and, you know, uh, the larva isn't as clear as you would like it to be, so as the cuticle compresses over it, um, you change the, the optical path so, as well. Okay. Um, so to try and form an image in something moving like this is really challenging. Right? And so we start off by saying, you know what, we don't actually need an image. Right? What, the, what the neuron looks like isn't interesting to us. What we want to know is we want to know how bright it is. Right? Okay. So 
instead of attempting to image this thing, let's just see if we can keep the, the, the beam, the focal spot that allows us to image, inside the, the cell. And so what we do is we go around in a circle. Right? So on the left is the full picture, and on the right is the information we have. Okay? So as you go around, you collect photons. Right? So it's brighter here, and it's dimmer here. Okay? And then just based on where those photons are, you can guess where the center of the, the neuron is. And you can update the scan, and then you can do another circle, the center closer to the center. And you do this really quickly, and you feed back. So that's the principal operations tracking microscope. All right? Um, I think I have flipped, yes, okay. Um, and so this is kind of a schematic of what we've done. We have X and Y mirrors that go around this circle, and that circle is about three kilohertz, right? Which is fast. Um, in order to get Z, we need somehow to move the focus up and down. And so what we use is this cool thing um, that was introduced to us by Megan Quee's lab at, at Genelia. Um, it's called a tag lens. And it's a resonant ultrasonic lens. It goes up and down. Uh, it, it, it changes the focus at 70,000 hertz. So as you go around the circle at 3 kilohertz, the, the Z scan is going up uh, about 50 times as fast. Um, right, because it's one down, one up. Um, OK. Um, and so that makes a cylinder. Um, and then we label a neuron with green calcium indicator and a red stable protein. And the, the, we choose a wavelength of two photon excitation that excites both of these. Right? We then count the red and green photons separately. Okay. Um, and you can correlate the photon count with where you know the spot was to estimate the neuron center. That estimate has noise. And when you have a sequence of noisy measurements, you use a column filter. Um, to combine them, and you get a best estimate of the position. Okay. And then you feed that back at 3 kilohertz to center the scan. All right. um, and then as the animal crawls out of the field view of the microscope, you just bring it back with the stage. All right. So this is a, a view from below. You're looking up at the objective. That white spot is due to the, uh, the microscope, the, the excitation. Um, and you're looking at a larva crawling around. Okay. Now I'm going to annotate this video with neural activity that we record from a microscope. Okay. So the red is going to be the, the stable baseline that we've collected um, using the red indicator. The green is the, excitate, the emission that we get from the calcium indicator. And then the ratio is the best assessment. That corrects for things like the cuticle deforming over and just making the light less bright altogether. Okay. Um, now sometimes I'm going to overlay that spot, the bright white spot, with my own spot, whose color and size matches the activity. Um, and so that's a kind of a, a, the instantaneous activity that time, so you can see what's going on. Um, because we fixed the larva, always have a neuron centered under the microscope, it may appear not to move. And so I put little dots on the stage to help visualize that motion. Okay. Now we're going to look at one of those motor neurons um, that I showed you previously in the immobilized animal. Okay. So here it goes. And every time as the peristaltic wave passes, uh, you can see this activity as the larva crawls. Okay. Now, if this were me, I wouldn't care about ratio metric. I wouldn't care about anything. I'd say, wow, that's happening every time this wave passes the brain. This is some kind of crazy motion artifact. So to show it's not, what we did is we labeled a similar neuron using GFP. So it's the non-calcium sensitive version of this. Okay. So if this were some kind of motion artifact, you would still see oscillations. But because it's due to the calcium transients, you don't. So that's our control. And to show you that we didn't pick the 30 seconds where this happened to work, here is about 15 minutes of crawling and activity uh, and crawling and flat for the uh, control. Okay. So now what we'd like to do is we'd like to analyze all of that activity somehow relative to the behavior. Okay. So what, what you'll notice is as the larva crawls, the brain goes forward, backwards, and then it shoots forward, right? And so there's some point in the peristaltic cycle every time in which the brain is forward, it's back. And so I can use that as a clock, or right, as a zero for my clock. Um, it's not at the beginning, it's not at the end, it's just somewhere in the middle, but it's a reliable point that I can find. Um, and so I can align the motion to that, right? And so you can see the x, uh, it goes backwards, so the x goes negative, and then it shoots forward and x goes positive. And you see the same stereotype motion over and over again, and you can see the brain going up and down as well in sync with that. Okay. Now I haven't aligned this to the activity at all, but when I use that same clock, and show the activity, you can see that the activity also is rhythmic and aligned with that cycle. Um, if I just have the stable indicator, um, then there is uh, 
there's no um, activity, there's still motion, right? So this is if it works. Um, okay, can we do more than one? Sometimes we can do two, okay? And so if I take two neurons that are close together, I can track one for a little bit, then I move the mirrors. When I'm moving the mirrors, I have to wait, I have no information, and the mirrors get to the new neuron, I track that, and then I jump back, okay? Um, and so these dots are no longer where the neurons are, but they're just kind of sort of offset from each other so that you can see them, but the purple one is farther back than the, uh, the blue one. And so you can see that as this lever crawls, every time there's a wave of uh, activity, both neurons fire, and it may not be obvious, but the purple one fires a little bit before the green one. And so if I show you all that activity, you can see that the one that is farther back always fires first as the wave goes forward. We can line up and see that. Okay, now this is an important point. The way we're doing this tracker is probably not the way um, someone who said, what's the best thing to do would do, right? These were tracking one neuron, and then we just forget about it. We jump to the other one, we have a completely independent tracking routine for the other one. So there's no information that, this, that, that the tracker knows about the relative position of these two, right? So these are independent trackers, and when you have independent things, if you've taught the undergraduate lab, you know that you add the errors in quadrature, okay? And so that means that the error in the separation has to be bigger than the error in the location of either one neuron, right? And so when I show you here that the RMS here is about 400 nanometers, whether these squiggles are due to compression of the tissue or an actual um, tracking error, I don't know, but it's still under a micron, right? So we're locating this, these neurons to better than a micron, right? in a moving animal without, without doubt, okay? All right, um, so now I'll show you, like we can do a couple of biologically interesting things. Um, so the uh, A27H uh, premotor interneuron um, connects uh, to those neurons I just showed you, and it does something interesting, which is if you take, so if you take the brain out of a larva, stick it in a dish, look it under a microscope, it will keep trying to crawl, kind of fun. You see these waves of activity, right, um, in the motor neurons, okay? Um, but they are um, very slow, right? Because presumably the animal thinks it's not getting feedback, it's, it's squished, and it's just trying to struggle out, right? Um, but nevertheless, sometimes it'll go forwards, and sometimes it'll go backwards, right? And then this A27H motor neuron, if you look at it in the immobilized prep, people saw, hey, wait, when, the, when it's crawling forwards, this neuron is active, and when it's crawling backwards, it's silent, right? <clears throat> Forwards and backwards are just based on the direction of motion of neuro, neural activity, not based on any kind of motion, because again, it's a brain in the dish. Um, okay, but now if you just actually look at that same neuron in a crawling animal, here it is backing up, um, and you see ratiometric correction is really helping us in this one. And now it's gonna start crawling forward, and you can see um, the activity, right? And so this, this what, what this said, you know, we had one, Lovely reviewer who we thank so much for their time and effort in reviewing our manuscript, who said, but this was already known because of uh, this. We said, no, with this, yes. What, what this shows is that this is a reasonable thing to do, right? Now we can confirm that, in fact, what you're seeing here matches what you see here, right? Um, but, but in fact, when you take the brain out, you've removed most of the inputs from this neuron. So it's not obvious that it should behave the same way at all. Um, and just to show you again that we didn't pick the one time when it happened to work, uh, there's another you know, 10 minutes um, uh, for and backward. All right. Um, so this is something we did um, in collaboration with the lab from Indiana and Chicago. Um, there are motor neurons, or sorry, there are proprioceptive neurons that sense stretching in uh, the larva's body wall. And so this isn't something you actually need two photon microscopy for, but it's fun anyway. Um, and so some of these, the, the, the cell bodies are next to each other, but the, the dendrites project in different directions. Um, and so what you can see as this thing crawls, the DDAE neuron, which sends projections backwards, as the animal crawls forward, that neuron is active, and uh, the DDAD neuron is silent. Okay. And I think that I um, didn't edit this video well, but we'll see. Okay, it's crawling backwards now. Um, okay, no, I didn't. Okay, and now you see DDAD is active, and DDAE is silent. Um, and so if we look at these over many cycles, um, so green is backwards and purple is forwards, 
Um, the DDA neuron is active when the larva is crawling forward, and the DDA D neuron is active when the larva is crawling backwards, as you would expect, <coughs> because they are next to each other, the movements of both neurons are the same. Um, and finally, you know, one of the things we can do, because this is two photon microscopy, is we can still provide a visual stimulus, because we're not shining much of bright light in the larva's eyes. So let's show you that's possible. Uh, we're going to flash a little blue light <coughs> on the larva as it's crawling, and we can take a neuron that's downstream of the eye, and we can see activity in that neuron that correlates with the presentation of light. Um, to show you this isn't some kind of very bizarre bleed through, here's a motor neuron that we're recording from that's active as the larva crawls, but it doesn't particularly sync up with any kind of uh, light presentation. Um, and so we can then take all of this data and we can analyze it um, in the same way. Um, we can align it to motion, in which case we see if the motor neuron aligns with motion, or we can align it to light presentation, in which time the uh, light aligns. Okay. Um, and so the point I would make here is that what we're interested in is how does this sensory information get transformed into motor information? Right? So here is a neuron that knows about the stimulus, but it doesn't know about the behavior. And here's a neuron that knows about the behavior, but it doesn't know about the stimulus. So somewhere in between them, is a neuron that knows about both of them, right? And there are neurons that transform information about the stimulus information about the behavior. And where that transformation is happening is where the decisions are being made, and those are the neurons that we can focus on. Um, so some other things we can do, um, this is trial, this is average over many trials, but we're doing a single trial, we can do voltage imaging using different indicators um, because our, our microscope is very fast. Um, if you want to do voltage in a bunch of neurons, then you need to be able to jump between them very quickly. So one of the things that uh, we've been working on is using acousto-optic deflectors to jump between spots very quickly. So that allows us to track many neurons in parallel. Um, we also are working on using the fact that we can identify neurons with micron resolution to do kind of interesting optogenetic stimulation things where you just present light to one neuron. Um, we're also working on a microscope that uses that stability to do kind of the volumetric imaging that I was showing you of all the neurons in the VNC, say, but in the animal that's crawling, um, but stabilize it using tracking. Um, and then we also want to go through and look and find out where the decisions are made and how. Okay. So um, this is a two-photon tracking microscope. It's capable of recording from motor <laughs> neurons and interneurons and behaving animals with no motion artifacts. Um, we've correlated activity in neurons <laughs> and behavior and in st with stimulus. right? Um, we tracked two neurons simultaneously. We have a plan to do many. Um, and to our knowledge, and I keep saying this, no one has ever raised their hand and said, no, you're wrong, so I'll just say it. Um, this is the first time anyone's done a two-photon recording of neural activity without actually attaching the animal to the microscope somehow. Right? That's the standard way to correct promotion, that perturbs behavior. Um, OK. So uh, now. I'm going to do the, the little bit mathy part. Okay. Uh, so, any questions about this so far? Yes. How do you know that all this fluorescent protein doesn't affect its behavior too? It's oh yeah. So you're like one of the biology. So people have been doing this for a long time, and as far as anyone can tell, it doesn't really perturb behavior. You know, you have to do controls of some kind. Um, sort of a possibly greater concern is that when things photo bleach, it can do damage, depending on the mechanism. But again, you know, we actually did some controls for this on some of the stuff, and we can't detect anything. Um, you know, um, but yeah, any anytime you manipulate an animal, you're making some changes. Um, and, and so you always have to do um, controls, right? Probably a, the, the bigger confound is that these animals aren't genetically identical. And so the performance of the parents on some task may be different. And then when you do the, the progeny may have different forms from the parents just because you're mixing up the genes, you know. Um, it's like, you know, my kid loves the guitar and I don't, you know, and that's, neither of us love the guitar actually, so presumably that's something that was either a genetic mix up or Washington Square Park. Um, but you know, so you, you can't control everything, I think is the answer. Um, anything else? Um, okay, so. This is this decision to turn, and it's a computation. Right? So what comes in is like, say, light or odor, and what comes out is a body movement. You either turn or you keep crawling. And in between, there's a black box. That's the brain. Okay? 
And whenever you have a black box, you have to put something in the black box. Okay? And if this were a linear system, there's only one thing you put in the black box, which is a convolution curl. Right? And you're done. You know Green's function, you know a linear system. <coughs> nonlinear systems can be nonlinear in all sorts of fun ways, and there's no like unique way uh, to do it. Right? The one we've chosen is um, what's called like sometimes a generalized linear model or a LNP model, um, where you take, you say, okay, there's sensory input, and what we have is a linear filter first that reduces the dimension on this input, picks out temporal features of interest. Okay. Then there's a static nonlinearity that doesn't depend directly on the input, but only takes the filtered input, in, filtered signal in, and it gives you out a rate. Okay? And then we just have to express ignorance and say something else happens that turns that rate into decision to turn or not, and we'll model as a Poisson process. Okay? So that's a model, and you can always write down a model. Um, and if you have a model, whoops, sorry, there are parameters, and those are the parameters. One is the shape of the filter, was the convolution. And then we say, can we even find parameters for this model? And it turns out, well, does it turn out? The reason we picked this model is because there is a well-characterized way to find these model parameters called reverse correlation. Okay? Um, and so to give you a sense of how that works, um, here's a bunch of random numbers between negative 10 and 10. Okay? And if you went in another room and gave me indices of numbers for a while and we averaged them together, what would the average be? Zero. Right? If you don't distribute it, what? Are they uniformly distributed? It doesn't matter if they're uniformly distributed or not. As long as the average is zero, right? If you can't see the numbers, you can only get back the average. Right? You can't get back anything that has different statistics in the distribution. Right? That's in an information theoretic sense. Um, if I told you to only pick the positive numbers, then the average would be five and a half. Okay? If I told you only to pick the negative sevens, the average would be negative seven. But the point is, in order to get anything that isn't zero, you have to be able to read the numbers. Right? So if I see something that's not zero, that tells me you can read those numbers. Okay? If I put the numbers in pairs that aren't correlated with each other, and I tell you to pick out ones where the second number is seven, um, and you did this often enough, the first one would average to zero, and the second one would be seven. And that would tell me that you only care about the second number. Okay? Now, let's imagine you play some game. This is a very fun game. Everyone loves this game. <coughs> I'm going to show you a stream of numbers going across the screen. And every time you see a 9 or a 10, maybe an 8, every time you see an 8, 9, or 10, I want you to hit a red button that I'm going to provide for you. OK? So here we go. All right? And there's one. OK? And there's one. And there's one. And if we did this for a while and you were perfect at it, this is what you would see. When you press the button, it's 9. The numbers are uncorrelated with each other, so every other one averages to 0. OK? Now, if you were a little bit slow, what you'd see is a, sometimes you'd be pushing the button when an 8 or 9 or 10 actually made it to here, right? So you'd have more here and less here. Okay? So that's what slow would look like. And if I told you, wait what, to. What are the x and y axes of this plot? Um, time, time after you hit the button press, mm -hmm. average of the numbers at that time. Excellent. Right? So in the first case, at zero, you hit the button, and you're only hitting eight, nine, or ten. Your perfect x is going to average to nine, and then the number before has nothing to do with it, so it's going to average to zero. And the number two before, and so on, right? I'm not showing you in the future because we're going to assume that you're not psychic, right? <laughs> but that's an important control we do. All right. So um, if you wait two and then hit the button, sometimes you'll be early, sometimes you'll be late. It'll look like this. Okay. So the point is, this button triggered average. What's the average value of the stim of the input? Conditioned on when you push the button carries information about the decision that you're making. Okay, what you care about and how in the temporal elements. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna put larva in a dish and we're gonna show them light changes. And we're gonna do changes and not values, random, cha ra random changes and not random values, because the animal cares about derivatives. So sometimes light will go up a little bit, sometimes it'll go down a little bit, and it's completely random. If I told you to push a button without being able to see the light, the average change would always be zero, conditioned on your button pressing. But we'll let the larva push the button instead by turning. And every time it turns, we will calculate the average change in light versus time preceding that turn. Okay? We'll call that a turn triggered average. <coughs> and what I can show you if you want later is that it has to be the case that for the stimulus we're providing, that that turn triggered average is linearly proportional to the input curve, the filter. Um, and so this is what it looks like. 
So here's a bunch of larva crawling around. Um, the light level is going up and down. I'm showing the derivative light change at the top. At the bot, and the next two are metrics of the behavior in our automatic flagging system. Um, and every time it goes from blue to not blue, that means it turned. And when that happens, we're going to write down the stimulus. Okay, so here's larva crawling, and there it is, and it turns, and so we write down the stimulus. Okay. And now here's the tenth turn, right? We're going to write that one on average. Okay. And so now this is time in the future. So this needs to average to zero, or I have a psychic larva. Right? And if I have psychic larvae, I have way more interesting things to do than this talk. Um, <laughs> or it means our stimulus is correlated. Right? Back here, it's averaging to zero because the larva doesn't care what happened 20 seconds ago when it's deciding to turn. But right before the, the zero, you're seeing a big bump build up in the average change. Right? And so after about 10,000, you see something that looks like this. And so that's the filter. Right? It's up to an arbitrary scaling constant. Once we have that filter, it's straightforward to calculate what the nonlinearity is. Okay? And then once you have those two things, you have a model. And that model should be able to make predictions. Okay? Now, it could be that everything we've done so far is just nonsense. Right? You can still produce parameters, but it doesn't mean they're real. So we'll test it on a novel stimulus. Okay, so here is, instead of random noise, a square wave where the light goes down at time 0, up at time 10, and then cycles. The cyan line is what you get if you feed that square wave through this model with no corrections. The black line is what a different group of larva who never saw that original stimulus actually did in response, right? And so nothing in biology is perfect, but this is, you know, a reasonable match, right? You would say, okay, LMP isn't everything, but it's a lot, right? And we actually, uh, and I get to later part of the talk, we understand this mismatch here. The fact that it kind of goes down and stays down means that LMP isn't the whole story because you can't get different temporal dynamics for up steps and down steps with this model, right? Because the temporal dynamics are set in the linear part. Okay. Um, but what I'll show you is that, you know, over 20 minutes, this filter stay the same, the nonlinearity stay the same, and so then you can use the first 10 minutes to predict the ten, second 10 minutes and do very well, right? Um, so that's light. We'd like to do the same thing with odor. Okay, it is very hard to flicker an odor. So what we're going to do is we're going to cheat. And instead of flickering over, we're going to use these optogenetic reagents that I told you about in order to activate uh, odor receptors in the nose using light. Okay. And we're going to use this wonderfully uh, new uh, reagent, wonderful new reagent, uh, crimson, which is like channel rhodopsin, but it can be activated by red light. And the larva can't see red light. So we can turn on a very bright red light. We can activate the nose without providing visual stimulus. And then we can use these GAL4 lines that, again, just call it the stock center. It'll send them to you 750, right, um, to label individual neurons, right? So these are the two neurons that sense carbon dioxide in the larva. And we know that's true because someone set the cell death package to that neuron, right? And if it just has the GAL4 line, it avoids carbon dioxide. If it just has the, the UAS Reaper line, it avoids carbon dioxide. But if you kill those two neurons and those two neurons alone, it doesn't smell carbon dioxide. So we know those are the two neurons that are responsible for carbon dioxide sensation. Okay. Now, it turns out the larva has 20 odor receptor neurons. Okay. Um, and so we don't know the same way that any two drive navigation, except people did a very, very clever thing where they made larva where only, two of, where only one pair of odor receptor neurons works at a time. And so we know that a larva that only has the OR42A receptor, which smells that velocity, can crawl up a gradient of odor. And we know that a larva that only has the over 42 b receptor can crawl up a gradient of odor. Okay. So now we can flicker odor like we flickered light um, using the same exact techniques, the same behavioral analysis. Okay. And we can put it in neurons that sense attractive odor. So we think that when we turn on the red light, it should be like it smells something good. Or we can sense, put it in neurons that sense carbon dioxide, in which case when we turn on the red light, it should smell something unappealing. Right? Okay, so here's the, the turn triggered average change in red light intensity when you put the channel in neuron that expresses smells attractive odor. And it, you see a big decrease compared to the light where it's an increase. And it's a big decrease in the red light intensity before the turn because it thinks it's headed away from the source of attractive odor. Right? Same channel, same stimulus, different neuron. And now it turn, the turn triggered average is positive. Right, because it thinks that carbon dioxide is increasing, which is bad. And if you don't have the channel, then you don't see any, um, uh, any um, response to the red light. So this is the it works slide. 
And again, you can then fit the step responses and do about as well as you did uh, for light. Okay. So lower return response on favorable stimulus change. Uh, we can model that decision as an LMP process by parameter of the reverse correlation. Uh, the parameter's model does a reasonable job, I'd even say a good job, of predicting responses to novel stimuli. And it works for natural stimulus and optogenetic activation neurons. Um, and then this is cool, right? Because what you're doing is you're taking, you're taking noise, right? You're putting in noise, and then you're videotaping behavior. And by, video, by looking at the videotape of the behavior, you're learning something about the noise. Okay? And so what that means is that behavior is responding to the noise, because otherwise it would be zero. And it means that your, your, that your analysis of behavior is sufficient that you can tell what's going on with the stimulus. But it doesn't, anything else that doesn't know about the stimulus can't contribute to the kernel, right? It can, it can give you something small, but it can't give you a false positive. So if you went in the room and jumped up and down and shook everything and made the larva turn, as long as you were doing that in sync with the stimulus, that would be zero. Right? If you put food on one side of the plate and they all crawl towards the food, as long as that food isn't changing in response to that stimulus, it'll be zero. Right? So it's very robust um, to, to what I would call oopsies. Um, all, right. Um, all right, so I'm going to tell you one more story quickly. Um, uh, so, and it's about variance adaptation. Okay. So um, it's been known for quite a while that sensory neurons adapt to the variance of the stimulus. So it's probably fairly obvious to you that things need to adapt to the mean. It's, it's dim in here, it's bright outside, but we can still see. It may not be as obvious that you need to adapt to the variance, but you do. Okay. So in this experiment, um, a blowfly was shown horizontally moving bars, and they recorded from a neuron that senses horizontal motion. Okay? And they move back and forth, and the neuron's insensitive when it's going left, and it's sensitive when it's going right. Okay? And now the, the bar was just jeering back and forth randomly. And in some cases, it was jeering back and forth with a small standard deviation, and in some cases with a large standard deviation. Okay. And what you see is for the same amount of movement, it's more responsive when you're drawing it from an environment where the motions are small and when they're large. If you divide that x-axis by the standard deviation, then those two curves fall on top of each other. Okay, and the reason is, you say, how much can I learn about the motion from observing the activity of the neuron? Okay, and that is maximized, it is peaked when the neuron's um, gain curve matches the width of the uh, stimulus. So that's variance adaptation. And it's been observed in multiple sensory neurons in multiple systems as, as a general feature. Okay. Um, the question is, should behavior adapt the same way? Right? And the argument in favor is yes, because behavior is based on sensory activity, and sensory activity adapts. The counter argument would be there's no particular reason why it's adaptive always to reschedule behavior to variance. Right? If you're on a very straight road and it turns a little bit, you don't want to all of a sudden steer really hard. Right? Um, and so there could be something that keeps track of variance and takes it out later on. Okay? So we're well positioned to ask that question. So we can just do the same experiment so we can switch the variance argument. Okay? Um, and what we find is for a visual response, you get a, a more, more response to the same change in the low variance to the high variance condition. So it adapts there. Uh, it's true for those fictive odors, attractive odors I showed you. It's true for fictive aversive CO odors. It's true for fictive carbon dioxide. And then what we can even do is we can take the CO2 receptor, we can put the same amount of noise in it, and we can put it in that flow chamber and turn the CO2 level up and down. And depending, the mean is the same, but depending on how fast we ramp the CO2 up and down, the response of the neuron also changes. Right, to the optogenetic activation. Um, and so then we can look at how fast it adapts. Okay, and this was something that was very interesting to me at first. I thought we made a mistake, and then it turns out it's obvious, but it's only obvious in retrospect or if you've read the literature. Um, which is, when the variance decreases, it takes the animal a while to adapt. When the variance increases, it adapts instantly. Okay? And the reason is this. Right? Um, Say you are in an environment with a variance of 1. Okay? So you're getting 0, negative 1, 2, occasional 3. Right? If you get 9, you know instantly from that one measurement, you are no longer at variance 1. Right? Because the chance of getting a 9 at variance 1 is you know, age of the universe. Right? If you're in an environment with variance 9, 
you're getting nines, eights, sevens, but you're also getting lots of zeros, ones, twos, threes. So in order to realize that the variance has decreased, you have to accumulate evidence of not seeing any high values. So that just takes longer, right? The optimal estimator is slower for a decrease than an increase. Okay. Um, and that's, so we see the same thing both for the natural odor stimulus and for the optogenetic activation of the neuron, right? Uh, this slower adaptation. Um, okay, and so now what we can do is we can ask the question, there's light and there's odor. What do you do when you get both? Okay. In this LNP model, there's sort of two ways you can do the combination. Right? You can imagine there's one system that does light, one system that does odor, and at the end, if either one of them says you turn, then you turn. Right? So in that case, you have two independent functions, you just add their up at the end, you add the rate functions together. Or you can have some more general thing that takes these two filters, combines them somehow, and gives you out rate. Right? So this could be something like, as long as there's any odor, don't pay attention to light. Right? That would be an attention thing. That would be some more John Narrow on here. Right? Okay. Now, we can then just do reverse correlation, where we do red light for our object activation, blue light for the visual system. The visual system is much more sensitive, so dim blue light uh, does a crosstalk to the um, motor stimulus. And so, we see that for an effective attractive odor, simultaneously, you would expect a decrease in red light to increase, to provoke a turn and an increase in blue light. Okay? And then we can look at what the filter outputs were at all the times that it turned. We can calculate moments and we can compare them uh, to predictions. I'll skip the math for you. Predictions made by these models. And so the independent pathways model doesn't work. Okay. Um, what did work for us is a model where the animal just adds these two together, makes some weighted sum, and then takes another one. And that worked really well. Okay. And it was able not only to explain this experiment, but the combination of steps, right? So in a model where you're adding them after the decision to turn, because the response to a, the, the nonlinearity is, is steep, the response to something bad is much stronger than the response to something good, they don't cancel. So if you have something bad, something good, um, they don't cancel. In that model, but they could if you did it at the linear stage. And what we find is that, in fact, the, uh, the early linear combination model predicts a cancellation and a super addition that the um, independent pathways model can't. So we're very confident now that the animals combine these things before it makes the decision to turn. And our model <coughs> is that it's adding them together linearly. Okay. Now what about variance adaptation? Well, it turns out that the animal only adapts to the sense you're changing. If you switch the odor, it rescales odor, but it doesn't rescale light. If you switch the light, it rescales the light, but it doesn't rescale the odor. So that's cool. That makes sense. Why would I rescale my eye in response to my ear? Right? But this presents a mathematical problem for us. Okay. So we know that good cancels bad, which means that we've said that they linear the minor odor and light signals, because that allows them to cancel. Okay. The larva adapts to variance on a single cell basis. That also makes sense. It's consistent. Right? Uh, it's where you expect it to be. But the problem is, when you measure variance, it's inherently nonlinear, right? You have to square something, right? So what I told you, if you believe this exactly, is that the animal is taking a square, subtracting it off, measuring the variance, adapting to that, and then throwing that away, except for rescaling the linear part, combining them linearly, and then applying another nonlinear, right? And it's hard to imagine the circuit that actually does that. Okay. So we're kind of mystified. This works for adaptation because they can adapt separately of independent rate functions. This works for combination, but you have this weird requirement that the adaptation needs to be linear, and we don't know of any linear variance adaptation mechanisms. Okay. Um, then we realize something. These are exponential nonlinearities. Okay, that we're using an exponential quadratic for this. Okay. Well, if it were, if it was just exponential linear, um, adding and multiplying are the same thing, right? Um, adding before and multiplying after are the same thing. Uh, with a quadratic, it's not exactly the same. There's some cross term that's missing, but it's not a whole lot different. And so maybe what's happening is the animal has two independent pathways that then get multiplied together at the site of combination. Okay. And that model is able to predict as well as the early linear combination model, but it makes more uh, biophysical sense. Um, okay, so the point I want to make here is that we've done a purely behavioral experiment. And I think we've placed very strong constraints on how the circuit is structured. Right? We expect that there are two pathways for light and odor. 
We expect that computation is done individually in each pathway, and then we expect that before any kind of decision to turn is made, these pathways are combined, and that the mechanism or combination is multiplication, right? And if any of those things turn out not to be true, I would actually be very surprised based on this data. Um, okay, so again, um, Myrna, uh, postdoc in my lab, um, was involved in all of this work. Um, Deutscho uh, was our microscope um, maven. Uh, and built the tracking microscope as his thesis. Ruben um, was the reverse correlation guy. Um, Jason um, worked on the reverse correlation uh, with Ruben, and Amanda um, on the microscopy of us. Um, and with that, I can take any other questions you guys might have. No, no, no. There's, there's three thousand. Whatever yeah. number it is. Yes. <laughs> like, how does this? How does doing these experiments fit into like any larger project of figuring out? Right. Because like, you ha you don't have a model of like like you're not clearly trying to in this experiment. Right. To untangle like some particular distribution of weights among right neurons. Okay. You're doing something a step back from that. But where are you? Heading? Right. So so here's the thing. We know, right. Where, where the inputs come in, okay? And we have a diagram that says what connects to what, right? And now we have a microscope that allows us to look as the animal's behaving, right? So let's say what I want to do is I want to understand just the visual decision, okay? So what I'm going to do, well, actually what Myrna and Paul are going to do, um, and Myrna maybe a little bit, and then Paul, if he wants to graduate, you know, <laughs> will do, is they're going to look at these first neurons. And what they're going to ask is, does when, when, I, when I turn on the light, does the neuron respond? Okay. And they will. But then the more interesting question is, I turn on the light, and sometimes the animal turns, and sometimes it doesn't, right? Because behavior is variable, right? The animals have free will, if you want, or whatever, right? <laughs> okay. If those, so say, let's let's work at the hypothesis that the reason that the the reason they turn sometimes and sometimes they don't is even though we're presenting the same light, sometimes the light appears brighter. Then what I would expect is that that first neuron we looked at, I would be able to tell based on the activity of that neuron whether or not it was going to turn. Right? Sometimes it would respond more, sometimes it would respond less. Okay? But let's say that's not the case. Let's say we go downstream. Right? Then what I'd be looking for is I'd be looking for the first neuron where I partition the activity into places where it turns and doesn't turn. There's a difference. Right? And that's where the decision starts being made. Okay? Now, one of the predictions of this model is that those decision-making neurons before the decision is fully made, it has to bring in odor information in order to actually have good cancel bad, right? If the decision is fully made, then you can't cancel it out later, right? And so that's a prediction of this model. So I should be able to look and say, ah, odor comes in to this pathway. I should be able to see it anatomically, and I should be able to see it looking at the circuit, right? So, so it's essential for that that you that you have a bunch of neurons you monitor simultaneously. That's why you're so. We, in, in an ideal world, we'd be able to monitor a bunch simultaneously. But we can do this just one at a time. Because what we can do is we can, we can look at the one, I mean, a pair would be better. Yeah. But we can just look at the one neuron that's, right, that we, we go to EM, we say, ah, this neuron is the next one. Let's call it, you know, fifth LN. Um, then we, so we look at fifth LN and say, okay, where's a line that expresses in fifth LN? Okay, we got that. Now let's just record from that mm -hmm. while the animal makes like a, 100 or 200 decisions of whether or not to turn. And let's ask, is there a difference? Okay, there's no difference. Who's downstream of fifth element? Ah, there's Bob. Let's go get Bob. Can we get in line for Bob? Yes, okay. Now let's, let's do the same experiment with Bob. Ah, uh, look, Bob doesn't respond to light at all. And doesn't know anything about the decision. Bob was the wrong one. Let's look at Rob. Oh, Rob responds to light, and there's a little bit of it, right? And you know, so you work your way down, right? And although I'm describing this in a purely feed forward way, we have from other experiments, from anatomical considerations, kind of intermediate targets we can also look at. You know, we say, ah, this neuron is particularly interesting to us, so let's have a look at it and see if it encodes a decision, right? And the, and the end point of that is that you, like, fully understand the chain of decisions. Right. I mean, our, our ultimate goal would be able to write down some kind of model that predicts both the activity and the behavior, right, that's being done, right? Um, and, you know, and, and so one of the things that we don't know as a field is how detailed the model needs to be, right? Do, do you need to go to ion channels? Can you do some kind of... You know, more general thing. Does it have to be integrated in fire? Does it have to spike? You know, do you need Hodgkin's hub? Right? 
So the thing is, whatever level you need, there's only 10,000 neurons, and there's only probably a few hundred that are involved in this particular decision. Right? So you could really simulate it at that level, and you could see this is the thing that makes it work or not. Right? And then you can <laughs> build from there. Right? Yeah. Can you, right. can you use these two um, study memory in those animals? Yes. See whether you say, you know, you give an order and then light right. equals at the same time and then you stop uh, the order and you just keep giving the light and you check whether the, the neuron involved in smelling right. is activated by the light. Yeah. Well, so what, what, we, what, what, what we can do, because other people have done this already, okay. is we know neurons that when you activate them, it rewards the animal. It's involved in learning, right? It's sort of, you know, the equivalent of like giving you a big dopamine surge, right? Um, and so, it's, um, so what Amanda says, taking those neurons, um, and she's exposed the animal to carbon dioxide, which it does not like. And every time it gets carbon dioxide, she gives it a little bit of pleasure. You know, this is a good experiment for the larva until it dies at the end. But <laughs> <laughs> um, um, and uh, and it learns to like CO2. So she puts it in this Y maze and it starts choosing CO2 every time, right? And so now we can ask a bunch of different questions. We can ask. What's the functional change? You know, we can look then at different neurons in the decision. And some, in order to do something different, at some point, some neuron has to be doing something different, right? Some neurons are doing the same, some are doing different. That's the site of learning, right? So you can look at the functional changes, right? Um, but then you can also look at structural changes, right? It would be possible, uh, and this is something our collaborators are very interested in doing, to take the animal, take it out, and do, do the EM again. So Albert Cardona is getting very good at doing EM. And so if you could say, uh, we could give him 10 larvae that have learned, you might be able to look and say, ah, and these 10 larvae that have learned from this particular neuron, this particular input, these are the synapses that change, right, on a structural level, right? So that's sort of the advantage of this animal is it's successful on so many different levels. Yeah? Uh, I have a very basic question. You know, oh. All your activity is based on this non wiring diagram. You always show this wiring diagram and say, I assume it includes both uh, axons and dendrites. Uh, but my question really is the following. When you say something is connected to something else, yeah. is it really, really, really the yes or no question? Either right. okay, it's so connected or not right. connected? Or maybe it's uh, okay, in so the morning it's connected, <laughs> it's, it's so hungry, disconnected. Or so. Um, so to go back, so I've, I've oversold a couple of things here. So one is that these animals, I mean, they have what we would call dendrites and axons because they have these projections, but they're not like our neurons because sometimes you get input on the axon, sometimes you get output from the dendrite. And the cell body sits distal, it, it goes. So they're, they're a little bit different. Okay, so axon dendrite might not be, we call them neurites sometimes, we're being very careful. Okay. Um, but by the way, but, they are symmetric, they can receive both outgoing signal and ingoing. Um, no, the, the synapse always has a single direction. Uh, and you can measure the, so what's, what we don't know from the wiring diagram is the way the EM is done is gap junctions. So we don't have any information on the gap junctions, so that's the other we're missing. Um, but the synapses we know, and we know the direction. And what you can do is you can count how many synapses there are. And you can characterize the strength of the connection by the number of synapses. I right? see, so there is this, the word strength already. Right. Um, okay. Right, and the idea is that basically each kind of bouton has so many vesicles that it can release. So, yeah, you know, so. I mean, you have, you have to start somewhere, right? Um, so what you can what you can do is you can count them, and you can see how reliable is that number, right? Um, and what again, this is not my data, but what Albert tells me is what's very reliable is the ratio. So if if neuron A makes 100 connections to neuron B and 50 connections to neuron C in one animal, or on one side of the brain, on the other side of the brain, it might make 60 and 30, but it'll always be in that 2 to 1 ratio. I see. Um, and then you can ask, like, when you get down to the single numbers of synapses, that's when you start getting, like, straight connections. Um, but in your logic, you say, or this, I forgot how you call it, Rob connects to Bob, and so on. Right. So you go, you go the strongest. You go the one that has the most connections. I see. Okay. Yeah, that's that's the logic. Know. You, you yeah. first choose the strongest. Right. And then, and then you can also write, so you can do this. When I, now when I say you, I don't mean me because we don't have EFIS equipment, but you can always go to those two neurons. You can inject current into one, and you can measure how much activity is invoked in the second one. It's dual patch recording. It's hard in, in Drosophila. It's hard in larvae. People can't do it. You can also do something that's 
almost as good, which you can put an optogenetic reagent in, in the one neuron, and then you can put an indicator in the other one, and you can measure when I activate this neuron how much activity then translates to the Which means it really not yes or no, but you can measure right. the degree of yes. You can, me you can measure it, right. Not from the wiring diagram. <coughs> you can follow it up. Question over here. Yeah. So um, when you're trying to reconstruct the response function to the, so you input noise, Yes. And then you measure many outcomes, right. and then whenever it cha uh, changes, you s just do you just stack that? Yes, just average law. Um, how good is your timing on the change? Right. Okay. So because, sorry. Yeah. I, I think you could do a hierarchical Bayes model and infer right. the parameters and deconvolve that much better yeah. than well. Stacking. So right. So here's this is. Let me go back here. Right. And this is a mystery wrapped in an enigma wrapped in a, you know, whatever. Okay. So. These are the filters, right? That says the time scale response. Okay, and you'll notice that for light and for odor, they're the same, right? Same time scale. Okay, now why is that? Because light can change a lot faster than odor. Okay, so first we said, well, probably this is our behavioral analysis software has some limitation, and so even if the response is faster, it gets spread out by that response. Okay, well, that's a perfectly good answer. But then you think about it, right? And the animal can only respond so fast, right? Through motor output pathway, right? And it doesn't make sense to perceive a lot faster than you can respond because it just puts in noise without giving you any benefit. So it makes sense that the animal's filter would actually be tuned to the speed of the forward motion, okay? But then you think about it even more, you think this animal actually isn't looking for arbitrary changes. It's looking for changes induced by its own motion. So it really should band pass the signal around the speed of its own motion, right? It wants to see the input that's at the frequency of its motion. So that's why they should be the same for both of these things. And, and this time scale is consistent with speed peristalsis, okay? But that's all just the hand wave, okay? But now, let's go to the adaptation. Okay, we can do these, right? Um, now let's go back to the other one, because it has the, right, okay, so, Right, adaptation is uh, slower to decrease and faster to increase, right? And that's a property of an optimal phase estimator, okay? Um, and in fact, what you can do is you can say, what, op what estimator actually predicts this, you know, and is it optimal, right? And so the thing, it, if you're doing this variance adaptation, you can always adapt faster if you measure faster, right? The more measurements you have, the faster you can realize that nothing is changing, okay? So you have to put in a speed of measurement. And when we put in a speed of measurement, we can find an optimal Bayes estimator that matches this behavior with a speed of measurement that is about the same as you would expect from this kind of learning filter, right? And so that's an independent thing from our behavior, right? Because this is now 10 seconds, it's not a single second. So it's, it's not being just blown out by our analysis thing. So that would be an argument that we would have that this filter is about the same. But really the thing you would want to do is probably just directly, you know, figure out where the time scale is coming from and then you know, put an electrode or something in. And people have done that. And what you see for the time scales um, in the chemosensory neurons is about this. So it's, it's uh, consistent. Any others? OK. Thank you, Mark. Thank you.